Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm Gene Bailey, and I'm glad you're with me. We're continuing today our journey through Armenia. The amazing research that we've uncovered as we learned about hidden revivals. It is so good to share all of this with you, and I know you're getting so much out of it. So let's jump right back into it, okay? Last time, we talked about huge revivals that hit Armenia. 500,000 people were saved in the Ottoman Empire that took over Western Armenia. Over 100,000 or more were saved in the Russian part that was Eastern Armenia. We have Armenians on fire for Christ now all across the nation, both sides. It showed up in their lives. It was said that there was not one poor among the Armenians. They were highly educated. They were highly trained. And the Muslims were actually eager to tax all that wealth that was coming. The other side of things was the Muslims didn't respect civil liberties and they didn't treat people like we know in our Christian nation. They didn't have the American Bill of Rights. The leadership and the military could give into their desire to degrade a conquered people at will. It changed everything the Armenians had to deal with. And when was the last time you heard your president say, I have a harem of women and when I want to, I can pull your daughter into it and just because I wanted to and I'm in the mood and she's cute. No, it didn't happen that way. Their lives were very different from what we know. When we spoke with Armenian historians, we were told Christianity opened up huge doors of opportunity for Armenians to educate their children in Europe and even in America. In a history filled with persecution, there were, for most Armenians, peace for around 50 years. However, what they saw of Christians in Europe and in America made them want to have the civil rights that we uh, were able to enjoy there in the Ottoman Empire. The thing is, they didn't realize how much the Muslims really did hate Christians. They tried various things to gain basic rights. Sultan Hamid's answer was repeatedly, no. So in 1895, he killed between 100 and 300,000 people. Things were about to heat up for the eastern side of Armenia as well. Armenians under Russian control had no way of knowing Tsar Nicholas II of Russia was about to be deposed. He and his whole family were going to be murdered. Armenians could have not known this would change their whole nation. It had always had a nodding approval of Christianity. Under the Soviet Union, the ones that stayed would learn the horrors of a socialistic regime that absolutely hated Christianity. Do any of us wake up to, and think, wow, today I think I'm going to ask to deny my Lord and die? Of course not. Life for a Christian in the Soviet Union was horrible. However, God had a plan to save as many Christians as possible. God always used prophets to warn the people or encourage the people where to find good news. In Russia, the people began petitioning the Tsar for permission to move away and live in other nations. He started the process to save his people by sending prophets to warn what was coming. Recently, we had an interview with Cynthia Shakirian, granddaughter of Demis Shakirian, and she brought us a unique inside perspective of what their family experienced while in Armenia. Let's go as Cynthia shares about what her family was about to learn as they had learned to escape the upcoming massacre. So there was a boy in Karakala, and he was known as a boy prophet because he was known for spending uh, hours and days on end with the Lord. So he went into a time of, uh, of pr deep prayer and fasting, and when he came out of that, he had a major prophecy he knew he had to deliver. So he, he sat at the table, and he wrote it all out. He drew maps. And when the town saw what he had wrote, they were shocked because this boy was illiterate. And here this was beautifully drawn maps and, and written in beautiful Russian um, uh, transcript. So they didn't understand if this was for real. But um, the prophecy basically said that there would be a time coming at an appointed time in the future where um, the Armenians were to flee, otherwise if they were to survive, because there was a great massacre coming. And um, that um, also it went on further to say, and the ones that did obey the prophecy would um, prosper, that their seed would prosper and be a blessing to the nations, and that God would pour blessings upon them. 
So this boy was only 11 years old at the time. So this seemed like an off, awfully heavy <laughs> prophecy. So, you know, some people just, they weren't sure if you know, they were to believe it or not. But what was really shocking is um, he did not say that it was time to go until uh, about 45 years later. The boy prophet was then 56 years old when he did, dis he did say that now is the time the Lord spoke to him and now's the time to go. Then about 45 years later, um, the boy prophet, who is now a man, but he was still known as the boy prophet, was about 56 years old, and he said, now is the time. And so he sold everything that he had, and he was the first to leave for America. And the prophecy also said it, it had drawn, he had drawn a picture of the East Coast of the United States, but the prophecy said, don't stop there, that they were to go to the West Coast. So that's exactly what the boy prophet did. And then little by little, as families left, once they arrived uh, in Los Angeles, they would write back to the one's home to let them know where they were. So that's how they all gathered together. And there ended up being so many uh, in California, so many Armenians, that a lot of the Armenians never bothered to learn English <laughs> because they kept their Armenian traditions alive and well. And uh, one of the most important traditions that they kept alive was in their home. They always displayed the Bible prominently. They had, and, and in their churches as well, they, had, they would have a pedestal and they would have an open Bible. And um, it, the Bible in Armenia is uh, known as the breath of God. And it was something that they highly reverenced. And so they continued all their traditions uh, once they were in Los Angeles. And I think it's interesting that uh, when he left, so here's an 11 year old boy, he has a prophecy. And mm -hmm. 45 years later, he says it's time to go. And what was really interesting to me is that he actually had several thousand people followed eventually. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. Thankfully, they did follow, yes, and uh, I'm so thankful that my family uh, was one of the many people that went as well. Absolutely amazing, isn't it? Now, we have huge groups leaving Armenia for America. Now, let's see what happened, as this is the precursor to what happened at Azusa Street. Cynthia, Azusa Street Revival, there's a great connection between Armenia, your family, and the Azusa Street Revival. Explain, tell us what happened with that. Well, how it originally started is upon arriving in Los Angeles, um, my great-great Bobby and his brother-in-law, good old Markadik, who seemed to always be around <laughs> when the Spirit of God was moving, um, they were walking the streets of Los Angeles looking for work. My family, when they arrived in Los Angeles, lived with three other Armenian families at 919 Boston Street in downtown Los Angeles. And, um, you know, just to try to, you know, provide for their families. So my grandfather, having six girls and one son, and his wife def desperately wanted to find a job right away. So they were searching and searching all over Los Angeles. So as they're walking the streets of Los Angeles, all of a sudden they heard singing and praising um, the Lord like they do in their Armenian uh, churches and their home churches. Now when you, when you say that, are you, are you saying they were uh, just their physical, the way they were demonstrative was the same, or, the, or they heard words, and, what was different? Yes and uh, speaking in tongues. Right. Uh, so they the recognize that, they recognize that from Armenia. Yes, absolutely. They were walking by um, horse stables and in a barn and all of a sudden they heard um, people praising God in the Holy Spirit like they're, they were used to. And they thought that only they knew about it. <laughs> they didn't realize, you know, it was also in America. And they were thrilled. So they went up to the barn and kind of knocked on the door. And the people swung the door open and welcomed them in. And I tell you, they were just so 
my great great Bobby was so thrilled to find other people worshiping God as they do. Now, it isn't, isn't, isn't that amazing? Here they are out looking for work, walking the streets of that area of Los Angeles, yeah. and they stumble on the revival. Not, yeah. not just any revival, the Azusa Street Revival. Yes. What a yes. phenomenal meeting. Yes, and it was on Azusa Street where that stable was. And um, really was speaking for much, much greater things that it was in the future that was about to come out of that. Yes, absolutely. We've heard how Armenians who listened to their prophets escaped to America. Some in Armenia were just seeing that there were huge economic changes going on and they left for America. Over 10% of Armenia just up and left. They left everything. They were riding in third class ships to any nation that would take them. The thing is for the majority of those who stayed under the Ottoman Empire's rule, they just couldn't imagine that there would be a massacre. The Turks had always debased them and degraded them, but they also let the Armenians raise their families, run businesses and travel. Since Armenia began, there had always been strife in times of trouble. It was just tough to imagine the Turks would massacre the empire's top money makers or their top artisans or the top engineers. It made no sense to kill what had made the empire so great, but they did. There was one more revival Armenia would see. As the Armenian Christians fled the nation, a revival began in Tarsus, a town that birthed the Apostle Paul. It spread the width and the breadth of the Ottoman Empire and into Russia's Armenia. This happened in the final moments before doors to freedom closed. God warned Christians to leave. The ones who stayed would pay with their lives. These are the modern day Christians being tortured like you see with ISIS. They're doing despicable, awful things to women and children like ISIS does today. Yet those who obeyed God were saved. Even as the Turks were doing horrible things to Christians, a wave of the Spirit of God crossed the Los Angeles area. Listen to eyewitness testimonies of what began happening. Raised in the likeness of my Savior, ready to live in paradise. Every new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. It has been three glorious services a day, every single day for over three years. You could hear the sounds of angels singing. You walked on the dirt floor of the church, but a ground fog with heavenly smells was everywhere, and people walking in it were healed. I hurried to Grand Central train station. It was a half mile away. I saw people get off the train and fall in the spirit, speaking in tongues. The train people said this had been happening all day long. Some said they saw a bloodline around Azusa Street, and when you crossed the line, you were healed. People fell to their knees and accepted Christ right on the spot. When I turned around to look, I could see the fire coming out the top of the apostolic faith mission. Fireballs from heaven came down to meet fire coming up from the building. It's like the burning bush the Bible talks about. I can hear people shout, I can see, or I can hear now. I see lame carried to Azusa, and they go dancing out. One night, Elder Seymour prayed for a man with a stump. We all saw this. His arm instantly grew out. It was amazing. First, the bone showed like a skeleton, then muscle around it, and even at the tips, there were fingertips. We all just praised the Lord. We just had never seen anything like this before. Glory to God. As we were praising the Lord, Oh, we just got caught up praising the Lord, praising Him. Oh my goodness. Then this man came up that had this huge, huge skin. On his, it, on the, the whole side of his face had an extra cantaloupe mound of skin. We prayed for him and I heard his bones crack like I had never heard before. And his face went back to normal. He was a rather fine looking man too. God is good. We were, it's amazing. Another night a lady came up to me. She was crying and she was in so much pain. She was missing part of her ear. It looked awful. What was left looked like a raw piece of meat. I prayed and prayed for her. And as I prayed for her, she said, oh, 
My ear! It's tingling! I looked at her ear. And it, it was amazing. I saw a new ear pop right out. Oh my goodness. She said, there's no pain. I didn't know what to do. Praise, praise God. I took the bandage right off. People would come in and every day, every service, it was like, what is God going to heal? Who is going to be saved next? Who is going to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Everyone wanted the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They could speak real languages too. The Arminians would cry when they heard Arminian. Then one night, Brother Lee spoke what sounded like Russian, and Russian Arminians hugged him. The Holy Spirit just fell on all of us. It was amazing. One night, a lady began to sing a song no one taught her. Then she changed into an unknown language, and a man sitting near her began shaking. He said, I know, speak your tongue, but that lady speak my tongue and talk to me about Jesus. And that man accepted Christ. There were so many miracles at Azusa Street and the lives of people who came just walked away completely transformed. The Armenian or the Russian Armenian Christians lived only a quarter mile away from Azusa Street Mission and they would translate the services. They preached at Azusa, and William Seymour himself would preach at their home groups as well. William Seymour called these Armenian Christians his fellow workers. It was wonderful for them to see the miracles of Azusa Street, praying for people and being the one to make the difference. That was one thing about the Azusa Street revival. It made each person special, and each person could change lives. One eyewitness said she prayed for eight to ten people each service. If there were almost a thousand services, that's huge. As you know, Azusa spanned many revivals and spawned many revivals over the world. It's just a huge fireball of miracles, of healing and miracles that keep happening, all about God's love. At the same time this is going on, the Christians are in Armenia are watching their very nation unravel. Listen to what Constantine had to say. Well, people in Armenia, my people in Armenia, they are, they are, um, wasn't just poor farmers or shepherds. They were bankers, store owners, and uh, we make a, they make lots of good things, very beautiful things. And, uh, but when the Turks come, they begin shooting and kill everybody, particularly Christians. And the uh, first who was killed it was men. They killed a the man. But then women and children, they were marched, marched to the desert to die. And then they start screaming and yelling, try to make people deny Christ. Would you deny the Christ? And uh, we could not deny Christ. Some even wrote on the rocks that as Jesus did not deny us, do not deny him. We have not denied Christ, follow us. Imagine, they actually picked up the rocks and they wrote just like this one, we did not deny Christ. The very rocks, they wanted to make sure people saw that they did not deny Christ. As Jesus did not deny us, do not deny him. We have not denied Christ. Follow us. Think of that. What a thing to think about. If they had denied Christ, it would have saved their lives. Muslims would have treated them like dirt for the rest of their lives, but they'd be alive. Instead, by not denying Christ, they were blatantly tortured before being horrifically murdered. In the face of such awful moments, the thing that's really powerful is the spirit of the Armenians. It truly is unforgettable. When the Christians saw what was going on, older Christians that could have escaped had the favor of the Lord. Instead, they stayed. They stayed to help the newer ones who couldn't. They were all about not letting any of the new converts of their revival lose out on the relationship with Jesus Christ. There were many, many, many miracles that happened. Reverend Manunigan in his letter to the mother-in-law said, the Lord rescued me from death on 30 different occasions. Many of his escapes were as exciting as the Apostle Paul's were from Damascus. 
Aurora is another person with an amazing story. She was a 14-year-old girl from a very wealthy family. All her family would die in the massacre. In fact, her entire village died, but she would have dozens of escapes before she ever made it to freedom. This is a quote from her book. She said, after seeing 2,000 women, girls and children slaughter, imagine that 2,000 women, while the Mohammedan bandits were doing this, they were praying and they called Allah. More than ever, I trusted and loved my Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing the number of people who willingly gave their lives up to save her. She would live out her days here in America. While there were many disasters over time in our media, in 1909, there was new leadership, the new Turks that just made things change forever in Armenia. Constantine has more to share on what happened in Armenia and in Russia. When the Muslims, the new Turks come, they kicked out the Sultan from his throne. Then we heard about the massacre. And uh, the border was closed. The many people was killed. And uh, Armenians was killed, 1.5 million Armenians. And uh, I was in Russia when the Tsar was overthrown by Bolsheviks. And Russia became Soviet Union. And during this time, Christian was disappeared, killed. And then we find out that most of them is was sell, sent to the hard labor camps. And by 1922, the population of Armenians was almost disappeared. There's not a lot more you can say about a people being annihilated, wiped out in the most horrific way possible. There is a lot you can say about the bravery that they exhibited their own and their loving ways they lived out their final moments of their lives. The ones who escaped have amazing stories of many escapes. Aurora wrote that at least a dozen people gave their lives so that she would live. Yet at the same time, we have Azusa Street going on. There are around 4,000 Armenian Christian jumpers, a few steps away from what some described as an awakening that would end up transforming the lives of over 600 million people. What a contrast between the two worlds. Tommy Welchel actually talked with eyewitnesses who experienced and saw things in the Azusa Street Revival. Watch this. This man worked for, in the railroad yards and he got his leg crushed and they amputated it. Well, it was getting gangrene with sores where the stub went down into the, that part of the wooden leg. And we want to see more to pray for the gangrene. Seymour's looking at him. He says, well, yeah, God take care of that. But he says, look, I, I'm kind of a little angry. Just get this wooden stub here off. Called some men over and they held it, took it off. And the man balanced on one leg and Seymour prayed for him. He said, Tommy, it was right here, but he says, Tommy, go, and all of a sudden, a foot shot out. Come on. Now, Seymour did not preach that night. It took him to 2 o'clock to find to get that brother to settle down. So many miracles. You know, when we go back and we look at what happened in Armenia and Azusa, they're actually, they seem like two different sides of the, the spectrum. On one hand, we have genocide, like uh, proportions we've only seen when it comes to the Holocaust. And then on the other side, we have Azusa with such incredible miracles. As you saw, Tommy Welch will right there retell some of the stories of limbs growing out and ears growing in. You know, it is amazing to see what was happening at the time. There will always be a spirit of God in revival. It was always there. So what do we take from all of this? As we learn through history and all that's happened with people, there's always his remnant, his people that are always there in the midst of such great horrific acts that are happening. His people were still there. You can be the one. You can be the one that takes this. You may not be living in what they're living through right now, but you can be the one that takes this revival to your world, the world around you, and see what God has in each and every person's life as you continue to be the revival that people see. 
Until next time, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Download the show notes and make sure you tell someone about RevivalRadioTV.com. I'll see you soon. Tell me about those that stayed back in Caracalla and what happened to those that didn't leave. Well, a um, little bit from what I know about it is many were given the option to deny Christ or die. And um, I have heard that many of them had terrible things happen to them, heads cut off, so forth. Um, and so a lot of, a lot of uh, tragedy. I believe there was about 1.5 million people who were massacred, um, Armenians who were massacred. It was uh, devastating. So, um, yeah, it was a terrible, terrible time. And have you been back to Armenia? No, I haven't, but I know for sure that I will be going uh, sometime in the future, and I greatly look forward to it. And um, I'm so honored um, that through, uh, I've launched the Dima Shakarian Foundation, and through that we are supporting an orphanage in Armenia that is mostly is, uh, helps children with special needs. So I'm so honored to be able to do that in my grandfather's name and honor him in that way. Believe me, when you really give your whole life over to the Lord and with the leading of the Holy Spirit, I mean, there's just no boundaries, <laughs> no limits. <laughs> the book is The Shakarian Legacy, How a Humble Dairyman Inspired the World, a Demas Shakarian. If you're interested in getting a copy, all you gotta do is go to her website. CynthiaShakarian.com and find out more about how you can get your own copy and read the story. Do you want to know more about revivals like I did? Listen, you have to dive deep and scour the internet and read books to get all the information you need. But right now, we've developed something just for you. It's Revival Radio TV. Here you can learn more about us, how to contact us, updates, but also learn about our timeline, a special feature you'll only find on Revival Radio TV where you can actually scroll through history and see what God did as He poured out the Holy Spirit on all the people.